Hello, I'm Chris Anderson. Welcome to the TED Interview. A really surprising interview today. Many of us have spent the last few years bemoaning the state of social media and its propensity to cause division and outrage. But what if you could use it to do something really good, like really good? For example, tackling the coronavirus pandemic. Today's guest, Audrey Tang, has been working on exactly that. Audrey is a self-described conservative anarchist. In 2014, she was a software programmer dedicated to protesting the Taiwanese government as part of the Sunflower Movement. But by 2016, she had become the country's first digital minister in charge of social innovation. Her work has had powerful impact. As the coronavirus pandemic swept the globe early this year, Taiwan managed to bring infections within its borders to an impressively quick end. Today, Audrey explains how social media played a crucial role in that effort. I mean, imagine that. Instead of spreading poison, social media can actually be harnessed to create a form of crowd wisdom to combat the harmful misinformation that spreads online and to hold both governments and private companies accountable to the public good. This interview was recorded live at the TED 2020 conference, which is happening virtually throughout June and early July. The conversation is hosted by TED science curator David Biello and current affairs curator Whitney Pennington Rogers. Here's David. Thank you. Please give a warm TED welcome to the conservative anarchist Audrey Tong. Very happy to be joining you and good local time, everyone. So, Tell us about digital tools and and COVID. Yeah, I, I'm really happy to uh, share with you how Taiwan successfully countered the COVID using the power of digital democracy tools. And as we know, democracy improves as more people participate. And digital technology remains one of the best ways to improve participation, as long as the focus is on finding common ground, that is to say, pro-social media instead of anti-social media. Uh, and there's three key ideas that I would like to share today about digital democracy that is fast, fair, and fun. Uh, first, about the fast part. Whereas many jurisdictions began countering coronavirus only this year, Taiwan started last year. Last December, when Dr. Li Wenliang, the PRC whistleblower, posted that there are new SARS cases, he got inquiries and eventually punishments from PRC police institutions. But at the same time, the Taiwan equivalent of Reddit, the PTT board, has someone called No More Pipe, reposting Dr. Li Wenliang's whistleblowing. And our medical officers immediately noticed this post and issued an order that says all passengers flying in from Wuhan to Taiwan need to start health inspection the very next day, which is the first day of January. And this says to me two things. First, the civil society trusts the government enough to talk about possible new SARS outbreaks in the public forum, and the government trusts citizens enough to take it seriously and treat it as if SARS has happened again, something we've always been preparing since 2003. And because of this open civil society, according to the Civicus Monitor after the Sunflower Occupy, Taiwan is now the most open society in the whole of Asia. We enjoy the same freedom of speech, of assembly, the presence of one as other liberal democracies, but with the emphasis on keeping an open mind to novel ideas from the society. And that is why our schools and businesses uh, still remain open today. There was no lockdowns. It's been a month with no local confirmed cases. So the fast part. Every day, our Central Epidemic Command Center, or CECC, hosts a press conference, which is always live streamed. And we work with the journalists, they answer all the questions from the journalists, and whenever there's new idea coming in from the social sector, anyone can pick up their phone and call 1922 and tell that idea to the CECC. For example, there was one day in April where a young boy that said he doesn't want to go to school because their schoolmate may laugh at him because all he had is pink medical mask. The very next day, everybody in the CECC press conference start wearing pink medical mask, making sure that everybody learns about gender mainstreaming. And so this kind of rapid response system builds trust between the government and the civil society. And the second focus is fairness. For example, when we ramp up the facial mask production, making sure everybody can use their national health insurance card to collect masks from nearby pharmacies, not only do we publish the stock level of masks of all pharmacies, 6,000 of them, we publish it every 30 seconds. That's why our civic hackers, our civil engineers in the digital space, built more than 100 tools that enable people uh, to view a map, 
or people with blindness who ch talk to chatbots, voice assistants, um, all of them can get the same exclusive access to information about which pharmacists near them still have masks. And so people design a dashboard that lets everybody see our supply is indeed growing and whether there's an over or under supply so that we co-design this distribution system with the pharmacies, with the whole of society. So based on this analysis, um, we showed that uh, the, it was a, a peak at 70%, and the remaining 20% of people who are often young, work very long hours. When they go off work, the pharmacists also went off work. And so we work with the convenience store so that everybody can collect their masks anytime, 24 hours a day. So we ensure fairness of all kinds based on the digital democracy's feedback. And finally, I would like to acknowledge that this is a very stressful time. People feel anxious, um, outrage. There's a lot of panic buying, a lot of conspiracy theories in all economies. And in Taiwan, our counter disinformation strategy is very simple. It's called humor over rumor. So when there was a panic buying of tissue papers, for example, there was a rumor that says, oh, we're ramping up mask production. It's the same material as tissue papers, and so it will run out of tissue paper soon. And our premier uh, showed um, a very mimetic picture in very large print. Uh, he shows his bottom, wiggling it a little bit, and then the large print says, each of us only have one pair of Botox. Uh, and of course, the serious table that shows that tissue papers came from South American materials and medical masks come from domestic materials and there's no way the ramping up production of one will hurt the production of the other. And so it, that went absolutely viral. And because of that, the panic buying died down in a day or two. And finally, we found out the person who spread the rumor at the first place was the tissue paper reseller. And this is not just a single shot point in the social media. Every single day, the daily press conference gets translated by the spokesdog of the Ministry of Health and Welfare that translated um, a lot of things. For example, our physical distancing is uh, phrased as saying, if you're outdoor, you need to keep two doge away. If you're indoor, three doge away, and so on. Um, and hand sanitation rules, and so on. So because all this go viral, we make sure that uh, the factual humor spreads faster than rumor. And they serve as a vaccine, as inoculation, so that when people see the conspiracy theories, the r not value of that will be below one, meaning that those ideas will not spread. I love this uh, humor versus uh, rumor. The problem here in the U.S., perhaps, is that the rumors seem to travel faster than any response, whether humorous or not. How do you uh, defeat that aspect in Taiwan? Yeah, we found that, uh, of course, humor implicitly means that it's a sublimation uh, of um, upsetness, of outrage. And so, uh, as you see, uh, for example, in our premier's example, he makes fun of himself. Uh, he doesn't make a, a joke at expense of other people. And this was the key. Because people think it hilarious, they share it, but with no malicious or uh, toxic intentions. People remember the actual payload, that table about materials used to produce masks, much more easily. If they uh, make a joke uh, that excludes parts of the society, of course, that part of society will feel outrage and we will end up creating more divisiveness rather than pro-social behavior. So the humor that uh, at no expense of uh, not uh, you know, excluding any part of society, I think that was the key. It's also incredible because Taiwan has such close ties to the um, uh, origin point of this, to the mainland. So how do you Given those close economic ties, how do you survive that kind of um, disruption? Yeah, um, at this moment, uh, it's been almost a month now with no local confirmed cases, so we're doing fine. And what we're doing essentially is just to re uh, respond faster than pretty much anyone. We started responding uh, last year, whereas pretty much everybody else started responding this year. So in any case, the, the point here is that if you start early enough, um, you get to make sure that the border control uh, is the main point where you quarantine or the um, returning residents and so on, instead of waiting until the community spread stage, uh, where even more human rights um, invading techniques uh, would probably have to be deployed one way or the other. And so in Taiwan, we've not declared an emergency situation. We're firmly under the constitutional law. Uh, because of that, every measure that administration is taking is also applicable in non-coronavirus times. And this forces us to innovate, much as uh, the idea of we're a open liberal democracy prevented us from doing takedowns 
And therefore, we have to innovate of humor versus rumor because the easy path, the takedown of online speech is not accessible to us. Uh, our design criteria, which is no lockdowns, also um, prevented us from doing any, you know, very invasive privacy encroaching uh, response system. So we have to innovate at the border and make sure that we have sufficient number of, for example, quarantine hotels or so-called digital fence uh, where your phone is basically uh, connected to the nearby telecoms and they make sure that if they uh, go out of the uh, 50 meter or so radius, um, a SMS is sent to the local household managers or police and so on. But we, because we focus all these measures at the border, the vast majority of people uh, live a normal life. Let's, let's talk about that a little bit. So walk me through the digital tools and how they were applied to COVID. Yes. So um, there's uh, three parts that I just outlined. The first one is the collective intelligence system. Uh, through online spaces that we designed to be uh, devoid of reply buttons, because we see that when there is reply buttons, people focus on each other's uh, face part, not the book part. Uh, and without reply buttons, you can get collective intelligence uh, working out their rough consensus of where the direction uh, is going uh, with the response strategies. So we use a lot of new technologies such as Polis, uh, which is essentially a forum that lets you upvote and downvote on each other's um, feelings, uh, but with a real-time clustering, talking about how to protect the most vulnerable people, how to make a smooth transition, how to make a, a fair distribution supplies and so on. And people are free to voice their ideas and upvote and downvote each other's ideas. But the trick is that we show people the main divisive points and the main consensual points, and we respond only to the ideas that can convince all the different opinion groups. So people are encouraged to post more eclectic, more nuanced ideas, and they discover at the end of this consultation um, that everybody actually agree with most of things, with most of their neighbors on most of um, the issues. And that is what we call the social mandate or the democratic mandate that then informs our development of the counter-coronavirus strategy and helping the world uh, with such tools. And so this is the first part. It's, it's called listening at scale uh, for rough consensus. The second part uh, I already covered is the distributed ledger, where everybody can go to a nearby pharmacy, present their NHI card, buy nine masks or ten if they're a child, and see the stock level of that pharmacy on their phone, actually decreasing by nine or ten in a couple of minutes. And if they grow by nine or ten, of course, you call the 1922 and report something fishy is going on. But this is participatory accountability. This is published every 30 seconds. So everybody held each other accountable and that massively increased trust. And finally, the third one, uh, the humor versus rumor. Uh, I think the important thing to see here is that whenever there's a trending disinformation or conspiracy theory, you respond to it with a humorous package within two hours. We have discovered if we respond within two hours, then um, more people see the vaccination than the conspiracy theory. But if you respond uh, four hours or a day afterwards, then that's a lost cause. You, you can't uh, really counter that using humor anymore. You have to invite the person who spread those messages into co-creation workshops. But we're okay with that too. Your speed is incredible. I see Whitney has joined us with some questions. That's right. We have a couple, a few coming in already from the audience. And uh, we'll start with how long has the humor versus rumor strategy been implemented? And were comedians consulted to make the humor? <laughs> yes, definitely. Comedians are our most cherished um, colleagues. Uh, and each and every ministry have a team, of what we call participation officers, in charge of engaging uh, with uh, trending topics. Um, and it's a uh, more than 100 people strong team now. Um, it's been like that uh, since late 2016, uh, but it's not until about a year and a half ago uh, do the professional comedians get to the team. Previously, this is more about uh, inviting the people who uh, post, um, you know, uh, quotes like, uh, our tax filing system is explosively hostile. And previously, the participation officers just invite those people. Everybody who complain about the tax filing experience gets invited to co-creation of that tax filing experience. So previously, it was that. And we have another question here. What would you rank the level of trust your community had before the pandemic in order for the government to have a chance at properly controlling this crisis? 
I would say that the community trusts each other, and that is the main point of digital democracy. This is not about people trusting the government more. This is about the government trusting the citizens more, making the state transparent to the citizen, not the citizen transparent to the state, which would be some other regime.、Uh, so, making the state transparent to the citizens doesn't always、uh, elicit more trust because you may see something wrong, something missing, something explosively hostile to its user experience, and so on、uh, of the state. So, it doesn't necessarily Lead to more trust from the citizen to the government, but it always leads to more trust between the social sector stakeholders. So I would say the level of trust between the people、uh, who are working on, for example, medical.、Um, Officers and people who working with、um, the pandemic responses, people who manufacture medical masks, and so on.、Uh, all these people,、uh, the trust level between them is very high.、Uh, not necessarily、uh, they trust the government, but we don't need that、uh, for the successful response. If you ask a random person on the street, they will say, "You know, Taiwan is performing so well because of the people."、Uh, when they tell us to wear the mask, we wear the mask. When they tell us not to wear a mask, like if you are keeping physical distance, we wear a mask anyway.、Uh, and so, because of that, I think it's the social sector、um, trust between those different stakeholders that's the key to the response. Well, clearly,、uh, part of that trust in in government was maybe not there in in 2014 during the、uh, sunflower movement. So, talk to me about about that and and how that led to this kind of、uh, digital. Transformation. Indeed, before March 2014, if you ask a random person、uh, on the street in Taiwan,、uh, like whether it's possible for the a minister,、uh, that's me,、uh, to have their office in a park, literally a park, anyone can walk in and talk to me for 40 minutes at a time. I'm currently in that park, the Social Innovation Lab.、Um, they would say that this, this is crazy, right? No, no public officials work like that.、Uh, but that was because、um, at March 18, 2014, hundreds of young activists, most of them. College students occupy the legislature to express their profound opposition to a trade pact with Beijing under consideration and the secretive manner in which it was pushed through the parliament、uh, by Kuomintang, the ruling party at the time. And so the protesters demanded very simply that the pact to be scrapped and the government institute a more transparent ratification process. And that drew widespread public support. It ended a little more than three weeks later, after the government promised. Uh, and agreed on the you know four demands of legislative oversight.、Uh, a poll released after the occupation showed that more than 75 percent、uh, remained dissatisfied with the ruling government, illustrating the crisis of trust that was caused by the trade deal dispute. And to heal this rift and communicate better with everyday citizens, the administration reached out、uh, to the people who supported the occupiers. For example, the GovZero community (G0V), which has been seeking to improve government transparency through the creation of open source tools. And so,、uh, Jacqueline Tsai, a government minister at the time, attended our hackathon and proposed the establishment of novel platforms with online community to exchange policy ideas. And an experiment was born called the VTaiwan that pioneered. Near the use of tools such as Polis, and it proved to be very successful. They solved the、um, Uber problem, for example. And、uh, by now, you can call Uber.、Uh, I just called it Uber.、Um, This week, but in any case,、uh, they are operating as taxis. They set up a local taxi、uh, company called Q Taxi, and that was because on the platform people cared about insurance,、uh, they care about registration, they care about all the sort of、uh, protection of the passengers and so on. So、uh, we changed the taxi regulations, and now、uh, Uber is just a, another taxi company along with the other co-ops. So you're actually, in a way, crowdsourcing laws that, well. That then become laws.、Mm-hmm. So, some might say that this、uh, seems easier because、uh, Taiwan is an island that maybe helps you control COVID. Uh, helps promote social cohesion. Maybe it's a, a smaller country than than some.、Um, do you think that this could be scaled、um, beyond Taiwan? 
Well, first of all, 23 million people is still quite some people. It's not uh, a city, uh, as somebody uh, you know, usually said. You know, Taiwan is a city state. Well, <laughs> 23 million people, not quite a city state. Um, and what, what I'm trying to get at is that uh, the high population density uh, and a variety of cultures, we have more than 20 national languages doesn't necessarily uh, lead to a social cohesion, as you said. Rather, it, I think this is the humbleness of the uh, all the ministers uh, in the counter-coronavirus response. Um, they all took on a uh, attitude of, so we learned about SARS. Many of them were in charge of the SARS uh, back then, uh, but that was classical epidemiology. This is SARS 2.0. It has different characteristics, and the tools that we use is very different because of the digital transformation. And so we're in it to learn together with the citizens. Our vice president uh, at the time, um, Dr. Chen Jianren, a academician, literally wrote the textbook on epidemiology. However, he still uh, says, you know, what I'm going to do is record an online MOOC, a crash course on epidemiology to learn about important ideas uh, like the R0 and the basic transmission and how the various different measures work. And then they ask people to innovate. If you think of a new way that uh, the vice president uh, did not think of, just call 1922 and your idea will become the next day's press conference. And this is this co-learning strategy. I think that uh, more than anything, Thing, enabled uh, the social cohesion, as you speak, but this is a more of a robust civil society than the uniformity. There's no uniformity at all in Taiwan. Everybody is entitled to their ideas and all the social innovations ranging from using a traditional rice cooker to disinfect the mask um, to pink medical mask and so on. There's all variety of very interesting ideas that gets amplified by the daily press conference. We're having some more questions come in. Uh, one asked, how do you ensure that digital campaigns act quickly without sacrificing accuracy? In the U.S., there was a fear of inciting panic about COVID-19 in early January. This is a great question. Um, so mo most of the scientific ideas about the COVID uh, is evolving, right? Uh, the efficacy of mask, for example, is a very good example because uh, the different characteristics of previous respiratory diseases uh, respond differently to the facial mask. And so our digital campaigns focus on the idea of getting the rough consensus through. So basically, it's a reflection of the society. Through Polis, um, the various tools that V-Taiwan has prototyped, we know that people are feeling a rough consensus about things, and we're responding bonding to the society saying, this is what you all feel, and this is what we are doing to respond to your feelings. And the scientific consensus is still developing, but we know, for example, people feel that wearing a mask mostly protect you because it reminds you to not touch your face and wash your hands properly. And these, regardless of everything else, are the two things that everybody agrees with. So we just capitalize on that and say, okay, wash your hands properly and don't touch your face and wearing a mask reminds you of that. And that lets us cut through the kind of very ideologically charged debates and focus on what people generally resonate uh, with one another. And that's how we act quickly without sacrificing scientific accuracy. And this next question maybe sort of feels connected to this as well. Um, do you think any of our policies could be applied in the United States under the current Trump administration? Quite a few, actually. We, we work with uh, many uh, states uh, in the U.S. and abroad on what we call epicenter to um, epicenter diplomacy. <laughs> so uh, what we're doing essentially is to, for example, there was a chatbot in Taiwan that lets you, uh, but especially people under home quarantine, to ask the chatbot anything. Uh, and if there's a scientific um, advisor who already wrote a frequently asked question, the chatbot just responds with that. But otherwise, they will call the, the science advisory board and write a uh, accessible uh, response to that, and the spokes dog will translate that into cute dog meme. Uh, and so this feedback cycle of people very easily accessing, finding, uh, and ask a scientist, and a open API that allows for voice assistance and other um, third-party developers to, to get through it um, resonates uh, with many U.S. states, and I think many of them are implementing it. And we have one more question, which is actually a follow-up. Does the ministry plan to publish their plans in a white paper, which sounds like you're, you're already sharing your plans with folks, but do you have a plan to put it out on paper? 
Of course, uh, yeah, uh, and, and multiple white papers. So uh, if you go to uh, Taiwan can help that us, uh, that is uh, where most of our strategy is. And that website is actually uh, crowdsourced as well. And there's also a Ask Taiwan Anything um, <laughs> website at fightcovid.edu.tw um, that outlines all the, in white paper form, all the response strategies. So check those out. A blizzard of white papers, if you will. Um, I'd like to uh, turn the focus on on you a little bit. Um, how does a conservative anarchist become a digital minister? Mm -hmm. Yeah, by occupying the parliament, we we went through that. <laughs> uh, but more more interestingly, uh, I would say that I go uh, working with the government, but never for the government. And I work with the people, not for the people. I'm I like Eddie, this Lagrange point between the people's movements on one side and the government on the other side, uh, sometimes right in the middle, trying to do some cultural translation work, sometimes in a kind of uh, triangle point, <laughs> trying to supply both sides uh, with uh, tools uh, for pro-social communication, um, but uh, always uh, with this idea of uh, getting the shared values out of different positions, out of varied positions, because all too often democracy is built as a showdown between opposing values. But in um, the pandemic, in the infodemic, in climate change, in many of those structural issues, the virus or carbon dioxide doesn't sit down and negotiate <laughs> with you, right? It's a structural issue that requires common values uh, built out of different positions. And so that is why uh, my working principle is uh, radical transparency. Uh, every conversation, including this one, um, is on the record, including the internal meetings that I hold. So you can uh, see all the different meeting transcripts uh, in my YouTube channel, and each uh, every of them has a URL that become a social object that people can have a conversation on. And because of that, for example, when Uber's uh, David Plouf visited me to, to lobby uh, for Uber uh, because of radical transparency, uh, he is very much aware of that. And so he make all the arguments based on public good, based on sustainability and things like that, because he know that the other sides will see his um, positions uh, very clearly and transparently. And so that encourages people to add on each other's argument instead of attacking each other's um, person, you know, credits and things like that. And so I think that more than anything is the main principle of conserving uh, the anarchism of the internet, which is about, you know, nobody can force anyone Want to hook to the internet or to adhere to a new internet protocol. Everything has to be done using rough consensus and running code. I wish you had more counterparts all around the world. So one of the challenges that, that might arise um, with some of these digital tools is, is access. How do you approach that part of it for folks maybe who don't have the best broadband connection or the latest uh, mobile phone or whatever or whatever it might be that's required? Well, anywhere in Taiwan, even on the top of Taiwan, almost 4,000 meters high, uh, the Savia or the Jade Mountain, you're guaranteed to have 10 megabits per second over 4G or fiber or cable with um, just 16 US dollars a month, unlimited plan. Uh, and uh, actually on the top of the mountain, it's faster, fewer people use that bandwidth. Uh, and if you don't, it's my fault. It's personally my fault. In Taiwan, we have broadband as a human right. Uh, and so when we're deploying 5G, we're looking at places where the 4G has the weakest signal. And we begin with those places in our 5G uh, deployment. And only by uh, deploying broadband as a human right can we say um, that this is for everybody, that digital democracy is actually strengthens democracy. Otherwise, we will be excluding parts of the society. And this also applies to, for example, you can go to a local digital opportunity center to rent a tablet that's guaranteed to be uh, manufacturing the past three years and things like that to enable all sorts of different digital access by um, the digital opportunity centers, universities, and schools, and, and public libraries, very important. And if people who prefer to talk in their town hall, I personally go 
to that town hall and with a 360 recorder uh, and live stream that to Taipei and to other municipalities where the central government's public servants can join in a connected room style, but listening to the local people who set the agenda. So people um, still do face-to-face -face meetings. We're not doing this to replace face-to-face -face meetings. We're bringing more stakeholders from central government in the local town halls and we're amplifying their voices by making sure the transcripts, the mind maps and things like that are spread uh, through the internet in real time, but we don't ever ask our the elderly to say, oh, you have to learn typing, otherwise you don't do democracy. It's not our style. But that requires broadband, because if you don't have broadband, but only a very limited bandwidth, you're forced to use text-based communication. Well, with access, of course, comes access for folks who, who maybe will uh, misuse the platform. You talked a little bit about disinformation and, and using humor to beat rumor, but but sometimes uh, disinformation is more is more weaponized. Um, how do you combat those kinds of um, attacks, really? Right. So, so you mean mal information then? Yeah. So essentially, information designed uh, to cause intentional public harm. That's right. And that's no laughing matter. Uh, so for that, we have a idea called uh, notice and public notice. So um, this is a Reuters photo, and I will read the original caption. The original caption says, a teenage extraction bill protester in Hong Kong is seen during a march to demand democracy and political reform in Hong Kong. Okay, a very neutral title by the Reuters. But uh, there was a um, sp spreading of a mal information back uh, last November, just leading to our presidential election, that shows something else entirely. That says, uh, the same photo, but says, this 13-year-old thug bought new iPhones, a uh, game console, and brand name sports shoes and recruiting his brothers to uh, murder police and collect $200,000. Uh, and, and this, of course, is a weapon designed to sow discord and to elicit uh, in Taiwan's voters a kind of distaste uh, for Hong Kong and because they know that this is uh, the main uh, issue. And had we resort to takedowns, that will not work because that will only evoke more outrage. So we didn't do a takedown. Instead, we work with the fact checkers and professional journalists to attribute this original message uh, back to the first day that it was posted. And it came from Zhongyang Zhenfa Wei Chang'anjian. That is a main political um, and legal unit in the Central Communist Party in CCP. And we know that it's their Weibo account that first uh, did this new uh, caption. So we, we sent out a public notice and with the partnering social media companies, pretty much all of them, um, they just put this very small reminder next to each time that this is shared with the wrong caption that says this actually came from the central propaganda unit of the CCP. Click here to learn more, to learn about the whole story. And that we found that has worked because people understand this is then not a, a news material. This is rather a appropriation of Reuters news material and, and a copyright infringement at that. In any case, the point is that when people understand that this is an intentional narrative, they won't just randomly share it. They may share it, but with a comment that says, oh, this is what the, um, you know, Zhongyang Zhenfa Wei is trying to do to our democracy. Seems like some of the global uh, social media companies could could learn something from notice and, and, and public notice. What advice would you have for the Twitters and, and Facebooks and, and lines and WhatsApps and you name it of the world? So just before our election, uh, we said to all of them that we're not making a law to uh, kind of punish them. Uh, however, we're sharing this very simple fact that this is a norm in Taiwan, that we even have a separate branch of the government, the control branch, that published the uh, campaign donation and expense. And it just so occurred to us that uh, in the previous election, the mayoral one, uh, there's a lot of candidates that did not include any social media advertisement in their expense. And so essentially that means that there is a separate uh, amount of uh, political donation and expense that evades public scrutiny. So I said, look, this is very simple. Uh, this is a social norm here. I don't really care about other jurisdictions. You either adhere to the social norm that is set by the control UN and the investigative journalist or maybe you will face social sanction. And this is not uh, the government mandate, but it's the people uh, fed up with, uh, you know, black box. And so Facebook actually uh, published in the ads library, I think at that time, uh, one of the 
fastest and、uh, response strategy, where everybody who basically have any、um, dark pattern advertisement will get revealed very quickly, and the investigative journalists work with the local civic technologist. To make sure that if anybody dare to use social media in such a divisive way,、um, within an hour there will be a report out condemning that. So nobody tried that during the previous presidential、uh, election season.、Uh, and Google and Twitter simply said, "Okay, we'll just refrain from running political advertisement during your election if that's your social norm." So change is possible.、Mm-hmm. Hey there, and we have some more questions from the community、um, about your reopening strategy. Are you enabling? How are you enabling restaurants and retailers to open safely in Taiwan? Oh, they never closed. Oh,、okay. so yeah, they they never closed. There there was no no lockdown. There was no closure. We we just said a very simple thing in the CCC press conference that there's going to be physical distancing. You maintain one and a half meters indoors or wear a mask, and that's it. Uh, and so there's some restaurants that、uh, put up, I guess, red curtains.、Uh, some put、uh, very cute teddy bears and so on on the chairs to make sure that people spread evenly. Some、uh, installed glass or、uh, plastic walls、uh, between the seats.、Um, there's various social innovations happening around.、Um, and、uh, I think the only、uh, shops that got got closed for a while because they they could not innovate、uh, quick enough to respond to these、uh, rules was. The intimate escort bars, but eventually even they uh, invented uh, new ways by handing out、um, these caps、uh, that are plastic shielding, but still leaves room for drinking、um, behind it.、Uh, and so they open、uh, with that social innovation. Well, it's a lot to to learn、uh, from from your strategies there. So the the big concern when it comes to、um, Uh, using digital tools for COVID or or using digital tools for democracy is always、uh, privacy. I'm sure、um, the citizens of Taiwan are are perhaps equally concerned about their privacy,、um, especially given the geopolitical context. So how do you how do you cope with those demands? Yeah, we design、uh, with not only.、Uh, Defensive strategy like minimization of data collection, but also proactive measures、uh, such as privacy-enhancing technologies. One of the top team that emerged from the police、uh, on, to, on how to make contact tracing easier focused not on the contact traces, not on the medical offices, but on the person. So they basically said, okay, you have a phone, you can record your、um, temperatures, you can、uh, you know record your whereabouts and things like that. But that sits strictly in your phone. It doesn't even use Bluetooth. So there's no transmission、um, technology used. It's open source. You can check it. You can use it in airplane mode. And when the contact tracer eventually tell you that you're a part of a high risk group and they really want your contact history, this tool can then generate a single use URL that only contains、uh, the Precise information,、uh, anonymized, that the contact tracers want, but it will not, like in a traditional interview,、um, let you,、uh, you know, ask. They ask a question, only want to know your、uh, whereabouts, but you、uh, answer with such accuracy that you end up、uh, compromising other people's privacy. So basically, this is about、uh, designing with a aim to enhance other people's. Privacy, because、um, personal data is never truly personal. It's always social. It's always in- intersectional. If I take a, a selfie at a party, I inadvertently also take pretty much everybody else's who are in the picture,、uh, the surroundings, the ambience, and so on. And if I upload it to a cloud service, then、uh, I actually decimate. The bargaining power, the negotiation power of everybody around me, because、um, then their data is part of the cloud, and the cloud doesn't have to compensate them or get their agreement for it. And so, only by designing the tools with a privacy enhancing as a positive、uh, value, and not enhancing only the person's own privacy, just like medical mask, it protects you, but mostly it also protects others, right? So,、um, if we design tools using that、uh, idea and always. Open source and with an open API, then we're in a much better shape than in、uh, a centralized or so-called cloud-based services. Well, you're clearly living in the future, but、uh, tell me, tell me, what do you see in the future? What comes next? So I see the coronavirus as a great amplifier. If you、uh, starts with an authoritarian society, 
the coronavirus with all its lockdowns and so on uh, have the potential of making it even a more totalitarian uh, society. If people place their trust, however, on the social sector, on, on the ingenuity of social innovators, then the pandemic, as in Taiwan, actually strengthens our democracy so that people feel truly that everybody can think of something that improves the uh, welfare of not uh, just Taiwan, but pretty much everybody else in the world. And so my point here is that the great amplifier comes, uh, no matter you want it or not, but the society, what they can do is what do what Taiwan did after SARS. In 2003, we had to shut down an entire hospital, barricading it with no definite um, termination date. Uh, it was very traumatic. Everybody above the age of 30 remembers how traumatic it was. The municipalities and the central government were saying very different things. And, and that is why after SARS, the Constitutional Court charged the legislature to set up the system as you see today. And also that is why when people responding to that crisis back in 2003, built this very robust uh, response system that there's yearly drills. So just as the sunflower occupy because of the uh, crisis in trust, uh, let us build new tools that uh, puts trust first. I think the coronavirus is a chance for everybody who have um, survived through the first wave to settle on a new set of norms that will reinforce your founding values instead of taking on alien values um, in the name of survival. Let's hope so, Lin. Let's hope the rest of the world is as prepared as Taiwan uh, the next time around. When it comes to uh, digital democracy, though, and, and digital citizenship, where do you see that going, uh, both in Taiwan and maybe in the rest of the world? Well, I have my job description here, uh, which I will read to you. Uh, it's literally my job description and the answer to that question. Uh, and so here goes. When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear the singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. Thank you for listening. Wow. So uh, I uh, s struggle to imagine a... Um, adoption of these techniques in the U.S., and that may be my um, pessimism uh, weighing in. But what, what words of, of hope do you have for the U.S. as we, as we cope with COVID? Well, as I mentioned, um, during SARS in Taiwan, nobody imagined we could have a CECC and a cute spokes dog. Um, before the Sunflower Movement, during the large protest with, I think, half a million people on the street and many more, nobody thought that we could have a, a collective intelligence system that put, puts uh, open government data as a way to rebuild citizen participation. And so n never lose hope. Um, as my favorite singer, uh, Lena Cohen, poet, also um, is fond to say, uh, ring the bells that still can ring and forget any perfect offering. There's a crack in everything, and that is how the light gets in. Okay, that's a wrap for today. Thank you to our podcast team. Our editor is Grace Rubenstein. Our podcast producer is Kim Niederfein Peterser. And our production manager is Anna Phelan. Our show is mixed by David Herman, and our theme music is by Alison Leighton-Brown. Thank you so very much for listening.